Hello and welcome to Eco Show. I am Henry and we're going to be talking about news, research, and other happenings, if there are any that I find, in the world of eco-related things. So this week that we're looking at now is the first week of the new year and the first thing that popped up today that I saw was in a popular news article it was about cave findings in oh I didn't look this up I have everything else written down but not this one but it was a cool finding where a furniture restorer found a interesting aspect of cave paintings where there were little dashes and things in the in old cave paintings of different animals that would have been out and about in Europe back in the ice age days and so that was pretty cool. He found out some interesting information, which was showing that there were drawings of different animals, and there were these little dashes that people didn't know what they were related to. And he had the idea that they would be that they were related to fertility cycles, and they connected that to moon cycles as well. So interesting discovery coming from some citizen science. So that's our popular science thing of the day. We've started out the new year. It's the first week of the new year. Think if there are any other big happenings going on. We had the situation with the climate activists. I'm blanking on people's names now. Greta Thunberg, and so she had a discovery involving pizza boxes this week, and so that was some interesting ecology-related, ecosystem, environmental-related stuff. If uh, if you didn't hear about that, basically she was getting into some sort of Twitter argument with the guy that posts a lot of misogynist stuff, and following their exchange, he was arrested, and the initial thought was that he was arrested because in his post, he posted a photo of himself, and in the photo, he had this pizza box, and people were saying they the authorities found out where he was because of this the location of this pizza box whether or not that but then it was found that it was they already kind of knew where he was anyways but it was still a funny situation that happened but so let's look at some research that was out this week so first i'm gonna look at the journal nature a lot of research comes out every week so eco related research that we're looking at i'm recording this on my phone so if i'm staring directly at you it's because i'm checking the time making sure this isn't too long or anything so the first article that i plucked out it's hard to pick what to talk about side note the journal nature it's a scientific journal I don't read it super, I haven't been looking at it super often because the things that I'm reading about are ecology related things and nature is cool but so anyways before thinking that I was going to do this podcast I slash video idea I wasn't looking at nature that much. 
And there's a lot of things in nature that aren't actually <laughs> nature related. So that's kind of an interesting note for me that nature can be more than what you think it is. And there's a lot of things that are beyond my ecology slash environment brain related things. But anyways, so I went through and I plucked out articles that were in nature that were more related to environmental science related things. So the first article was by Camila Rivas and it was breaking down the impact that Alfred Russell Wallace is having on indigenous researchers today. And Alfred Russell Wallace, who I don't know a huge amount about, but he was a contemporary of Darwin, so we're talking about the 1850s here. And while Darwin was off on the Beagle, I believe it was, Darwin went to the Galapagos and saw different birds with different sorts of beaks and that sort of where some of his ideas around evolution are credited as coming from, roughly. And Alfred Russell Wallace also came up with the idea of evolution or that nature selects, and I'm using air quotes here because the idea that nature is doing, is choosing something is not really precise, I guess I'd say. But anyway, so he, he came up with the same idea at the same time from looking at the environment and what he was looking at at the time. So they're both credited with discovering, if we can say that's, uh, I'm sure that ideas around evolution existed much before the 1850s <laughs> and two, uh, two nicely bearded European dudes discovered it, but that's where we credit that discovery coming from. So we're getting around to the point, some will get there at some point. Yeah, so Darwin was off on the boat. He was looking at birds and seeing different things happening on islands and getting ideas about ecology and related things. And so we have Alfred Russell Wallace and his ideas around evolution came from his time apparently in Southeast Asia, I was seeing in this article, but I didn't really bother to read what it was about that experience that brought him to discover, I've got to use, what's another word I can use, to think up personally, to personally think up the idea of evolution. That's a screeching parrot, if you could hear that. It was just flying by outside. Okay, so this article is talking about this contemporary of Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, and his, they're saying, inspiration on indigenous researchers. And that's because he also did research in the Amazon. And while he was there, the ideas that he was having about the Amazon was related to the structure of the rivers and the landscape and how different animals wouldn't pass certain rivers and things like that. So he was seeing similar, in some way similar things to what Darwin was seeing on islands, but he was seeing the impacts of these massive rivers on animal communities. So I don't know if I should be looking at the camera more or if that would be strange, but 
I'm looking at my laundry. <laughs> and so he was working in the Amazon way back in the day in the 1850s or so. And during that time there, and so he was also noting what indigenous communities were doing and seeing at the time and how they were interacting with the landscape. So I'm sure his survival <laughs> and existence in the Amazon was only possible because of indigenous people that were there at the time. And it's not so much the point in this article is that it's not so much his research that, or his ideas that are influencing indigenous researchers around the Amazon today, but he was keeping notes about different practices and different things that people were doing in the Amazon at the time. So people are finding inspiration really about themselves because of information that was written down about the people living there at the time. And that's about that, about that one. So how are we doing? Okay, we're cruising along. We're going to keep this to... We'll see how we do if, if I can get to a half an hour. My goal is to be less than that. But there's so many articles. There's so much to talk about. So, and stick around because at the end, we'll be talking about, I should have put this at the at the start, but if you've held on this long, that's fantastic. But at the end, we're going to be talking about what killed the rarest snake in North America. So I think I'll put that as the title because that's a good little hook, and that'll maybe keep you around. So we've got another article, which is about nitrogen. We'll see if we can keep you here through that. And the article, this is still in Nature, by Long Long Xia and Xia Yuan Yan. The article is talking generally about how nitrogen is crucial for our survival in terms of fertilizer we use a lot of fossil fuels and energy to produce fertilizer by taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere i believe for the most part and putting it into fertilizer and we use that fertilizer to grow plants in order to grow food for ourselves. How about that? And I really hope this microphone is working. If this microphone isn't working, that will be tragic. Okay, so we're talking about nitrogen in this article and how important it is, but not only is does it take a lot of energy to produce, it also is very polluting to the environment. So when you dump a bunch of nitrogen onto your pasture, let's say, so you grow more grass, you are inevitably going to get some of that running off into the river or sinking down into groundwater and it's going to be spreading into the environment and particularly when it's in streams that nitrogen which plants like for growing is also going to be used by plants in the stream that we don't want to be growing usually some sorts of algae that can make these waterways unhealthy so they are detailing this. This was a commentary on a later research paper that came out in this episode, in this article, in this, how am I going to, what's the word for it? In this 
edition of nature. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about nitrogen poisoning ecosystems. Okay, so, and the point, <laughs> the point of this is that there are methods that are coming out around how to use this nitrogen and basically that use of nitrogen in an effective way comes down to applying nitrogen to your plants at the times when they're going to be taking up and using it and when it's less likely to be spilled out. So this can be an effective method to not only use less nitrogen and be more efficient with fertilizer use in general, but also pollute the environment less. And the downside, unfortunately, of this is that it can be resource intensive and there can be a bit of barrier to entry for landholders to be able to implement this. Okay, that's that. Where are we at? Oh man, I got a bit to get through. Okay, next article from this edition of Nature is about organic carbon in the global ocean. And we're talking about, so there was a survey done of organic carbon that was buried in the ocean during the Neogene period, which was 23 to 3 million years ago. So back on that day, and why they're looking at organic carbon is that carbon that sinks through the ocean or that's that sinks to the bottom of the ocean is seen as a sink of carbon and so when we're when models are being done to see how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere how much is in the ocean what are these cycles looking like part of that big calculation that's done to understand how much carbon there is out on the town is how much sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And they are looking through this long time period, over 20 million years, to get a better understanding of those rates of carbon deposition to understand that better and unfortunately what it's looking like they were finding is that what estimates we have of how much carbon is buried may be a bit higher maybe a bit may not be right so I'm not particularly sure what time period that they're looking over but if most looks at carbon deposition have been looking at more recent periods of time thinking about the past three million years that period has generally been a bit more chilly kind of ice age related and when they're looking at these further back periods of time when there are periods of the ocean being a bit warmer, it looks like organic carbon burial happened less. So possibly less organic, less carbon coming out of the atmosphere ultimately and sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And a possible idea for why this might be the case that they're putting forward is that in these warmer periods of time, there may have been more biological activity and that increased biological activity. So little hungry, hungry little guys in the ocean eating up more organic carbon 
may have led to more cycling of that carbon back up into the atmosphere. So they're saying that during these warm periods, that carbon cycle may have been a positive feedback of global warming. So all that means is that as the oceans get warmer, you're then having more carbon left up in the atmosphere and then the ocean is getting warmer and then you're getting more spat back out and so that's a positive positive not in an emotional sense but in an increasing sense an increasing issue sense so there you have that and oceans unfortunately now are warming so that's kind of a little bit of the a little bit of a, you know, possible application of that. But they're just looking at the past. Who knows what could be happening into the future. Okay, let's, that, and that's pretty much everything that I could find that I could understand to some extent in the Journal of Nature for this month, January 2023. And I've I got so many journals out to look at because there are so many good journals making producing things, but I was really unable to get to nature and ecology for this in order to get it under half an hour, and we're going to be pushing it, so we're going to be moving and grooving. The first article that I liked. And these article titles in ecology are very straightforward, very to the point. So I'm not going to read you the titles until afterwards because it gives the whole story away. But did I say that the, uh, and the author for that last, the title and the author for the last paper was Neogene Burial of Organic Carbon in the Global Ocean by Zia Li at all and so let's move on to ecology this article is by michael caspati and ellen a r welty and they were interested in what peeing on the ground does and particularly prairies and what would have and prairies are big grasslands, usually talking about big grasslands in the U.S. And why are they interested in peeing in the ground, particularly in these prairie areas? And not only regular pee, but pee, <laughs> pee of bovine animals and what were, what used to be in the prairie were lots of bison. There were Millions and millions of bison, and they would have been inevitably peeing all over the place. And so they were interested in what peeing on the ground does to plant communities and those impacts. And when you add, and particularly the components of urine that they were adding to the ground were sodium and potassium, And what they found from that was that when you add these to grassland, they act as electrolytes. And electrolytes, which we love in the form of Gatorade and things like that. I'll be honest, I didn't read into what electrolytes really do for plants. I'm not particularly aware of that. But the findings of this were that when you add these electrolytes, plants are able to moderate their above and below ground or above ground biomass to fit the conditions. So when it's warm and summery out, there's more biomass, and when there's when it's cold out, there's less. So my takeaway from that is that there's sort of if you think of the application of Gatorade. Now it's. I don't think it's. Right. I don't think it's right. I was trying to make a relation to 
electrolytes for us and plants, but it's not particularly the same. So I'm not going to go down that road. But what I will say is adding this did have an impact on plants and it also had an impact on insects. So it would seem that when you have pee on the ground in prairie areas that allows prairies to sort of do their thing and adapt to conditions better. We can say that's the takeaway. So the title of that was Electrolytes on the Prairie, How Urine-Like Additions of Sodium and Potassium Shape the Dynamics of a Grassland Food Web. And it's a great title, but it gives away the whole story, so I can't read that to begin with. The next one, by Yannicka M. Kerner. I um, don't recall if it was if there were other people, but so let's say et al. But it might not have been et al. for that one. I'll put these somewhere, probably in the notes of the show, if you can do that. So we can see who was writing these. And this article was exploring pretty much the impacts of climate change in alpine communities, and particularly butterflies. So they were in Germany, out in the mountains, prancing about, laying transects, and a transect is a line that you would then set out plots on. So you would go measure out your transect and then set out plots along that. And along this transect, they were looking at butterflies and their host plants. And they started in 2009 looking at this and then came back. And they found over the 13 years when they came back, they found that butterflies were living higher on the mountain because it fit more with the the temperatures and the things like that they liked the climate higher up was nicer for them but their host plants didn't make that shift so there's sort of a disconnect that's happening there between the host plants of these butterflies and where the butterflies like to be but they need the host plants and it doesn't appear as though they've adapted to higher elevation host plants as of yet so sort of a sad one with that but but the title of the article was not sad the title of the article was alpine butterflies want to fly high species and communities shift upwards faster than their host plants and that was a lovely title that felt very nice want to alpine butterflies want to fly high but again it gives away the whole it gives away the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> and our next piece of research that's being, that was done was, ooh, this one is, was a cool one. Ooh, I've got some, ooh, I should have alluded to this one earlier as well. Anyhow, we're talking about killer whales, which people like. And if you don't like killer whales, you probably like sharks. And guess what? We're talking about killer whales and sharks. And I believe this was in relation to sort of a viral video that went out a little bit ago, which you may or may not have seen, but it's probably on YouTube somewheres. Anyhow, killer whales, orcas, and great white sharks are both apex predators. And what happens when you mix two apex predators? That's what we're going to find out. And that's what they found out. So, killer whales have been known to attack great whites. And apparently, the liver of a great white is the perfect amount of energy for a killer whale in a day. And... So it's just a nice little hamburger munch that these killer whales would go for. And so there's this drone footage of five killer whales going after 
a shark. And what this article was looking at is the flight response of the sharks. And so apex predator, there's not so much, there's not a lot of information on the interaction between killer whales and sharks, but this was talking about how the response of these sharks is was similar in some ways to what seals will do to sharks. And so when a seal is trying to flee a shark, it's going to try and get away, but in a way that it's sort of circling the shark. So to try and keep an eye on it in a way, so you can sort of be circling it. So you're looking at it, but then possibly still moving forward in some way. And so the sharks were doing similar techniques with these killer whales, but the killer whales are pretty smart. So they were just hunting and munching them down. So there you have it. And we're about at time. So now for the, the article of the day, what killed the rarest snake in North America? And it's going to surprise you because it surprised me. And so there's this very rare snake called the Rimrock Crowned Snake. Rimrock. And its scientific name is Tantilla Ulitica. And so somebody found this very rare snake dead in its, the area where it lives, which is in Key Largo, Florida, which is down the bottom of Florida, and it was found dead with a centipede in its mouth. And so they were looking at, in this research, how did it actually die? And this interest was because the snake is very rare and they didn't want to dissect it, so they were using it was either an MRI or CT, I should have written it down, but they used a MRI-like scanning to look at the snake and to see if what sort of, how it got clogged up in the mouth, basically, and, or did it get bitten and poisoned. And it looks like they thought that it looks like it, got asphyxiated so it looks like it choked on this centipede that was trying to eat and it was trying to eat it whole and it was really it really had the whole centipede in its mouth and in a lot of its body so sad because yeah really sad because it's a rare snake that now is looking like it is gone and well, it's called What Killed the Rare Snake. So it might actually, it might not be the last, hopefully it's not the last of this snake. I'm going to say it's not, but it could be. So there you have that. And that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're at with that. So it died hopefully doing what it loved, which was eating bugs, which could be an enjoyable thing to do. So wrap up of the week, we've got lots of interesting research going on, lots of climate change research as usual. There's still so much to understand about animals, which is very cool. And we are moving and grooving along. So whether you're in a place with winter right now, I was seeing actually that Europe is looking pretty warm at the moment. So, and then it's, uh, they've got the blizzards going on in the East coast. So lots of different weather conditions, but I hope whatever the weather conditions where you are, are shooting you well. And, uh, that's about it. So we'll catch you when you catch ya. And have a good one. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye.